If you have your Bible this morning, turn to Genesis chapter 3. And as you do that, let me give you just a little bit of background, in case you weren't here a few weeks ago, in case you're not familiar with this story. In Genesis chapter 3, we find the first people, Adam and Eve. That's all there was, just two. And they were given a command by God. God said, look, Adam and Eve, I've created this garden for you. It was an amazing place. If you read uh, back the creation story in chapters 1 and 2, you'll see it was paradise. And God said, Adam and Eve, from every tree of the garden you can freely eat. You can go and you can have as many bananas as you want. You can pig out on papaya. You can have mango. You can have any fruit of any of the trees in the garden. There's one tree, and just so you won't miss it, just so you won't be confused, just so you won't wonder, is that the right one? I'm going to place it right smack dab in the middle of the garden so that you, there won't be any question about which tree it is. That tree in the middle is the one that you don't eat from. Uh, every other one, have at it, go for it. But that one, don't eat from it. And so what we see in chapter 3 is that Satan shows up in the form of a serpent. He begins to deceive Eve. She falls for it. She eats from the tree. Then she gives to Adam. And again, the implication was that she didn't have to go find him. He was right there, complicit with the whole thing. He eats. Now they've fallen. We pick up in verse 7 of Genesis 3. Then the eyes of both of them were open. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Now, I I'm reading this going for the first time. They knew they were naked? Did they just realize they didn't have any clothes on? I mean, they'd been living together all this time in the garden, and for the first time it was like, Eve, my goodness, you don't have any clothes on. You're naked. Did they just realize that for the first time? I mean, I think you would notice something like that, right? Well, the point is, remember, they're the only two people out there. They're everybody. And nobody wears clothes. There's just two of them. They don't even know what clothes are. Because they don't wear clothes. So you go, well, what's happening here? Well, all of a sudden, they realize they're exposed. So why didn't they realize it before? Because it was no problem before. Now, all of a sudden, it's a problem. You say, what's the problem? The problem is, all of a sudden, nothing is hidden. Everything is exposed. And it brings shame they're standing there going, oh, man, uh, we need to do something here. And so they grab fig leaves. You go, why fig leaves? I don't know, maybe that's the closest thing that was there. I don't know. I, I'm not really sure there's any significance. Maybe it was just a really big leaf, and it was easy to use. But, I mean, they grabbed fig leaves. But they began to experience something they had never experienced before, shame. And shame only comes, true shame. Now, you can feel false shame, but true shame only comes when something has been violated. And so now, all of a sudden, they're exposed. They've lost their innocence. And I was thinking about this, and they, you know, little kids, little, little kids, they don't think anything about running around naked, you know? I'll pull up uh, into our neighborhood, and there's some little kids that live across the street, and they're a little bit older now, but when they were really little, man, it was nothing to pull in there, and there's one of them running around the yard all naked, you know? And nobody's thinking anything. Of, they're not concerned about it. They're not, you know, they're having a great time, just hanging free, going, doing their thing, right? But there, there comes a point, as those kids begin to grow, all of a sudden they realize, oh, I need some clothes, right? Adam and Eve lost their innocence. And now everything's exposed. Everything's exposed. And that's kind of a setup for what comes next. Look at verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and he said to him, Where are you? 
he said, well, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, uh, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now maybe you've already picked it out. Maybe in that whole little section we just read, you've picked out those two supplied lies. And if you did, great. If you didn't, as I give them to you, you're going to go, oh yeah, I can see that now. But in there, there are two lies that Satan supplies. You go, well, wait a minute, how do you know Satan supplies? Because Satan got the whole thing started. And he's just continuing to work in their hearts and in their lives in this situation. God comes to Adam and he says, Adam, where are you? It wasn't that God didn't know where Adam was. He knew exactly where Adam was. He wanted Adam to figure out where he was. Adam, something's wrong. I come and I talk with you and walk with you during the cool of the day every day. And you've never hit on me before. Adam, where are you? See, many times God brings questions into our lives, not because he doesn't know, but he's trying to get us to realize we're not in the place that we need to be. Adam, what's going on? Where are you? Why, why are you hiding? And listen to Adam's answer. Adam says, well, I heard you, and I was afraid. And he, wasn't, he didn't say he was afraid because he'd eaten from the forbidden fruit. He said, I was afraid. Why? Because I was naked. So how did he deal with it? I hid. We hid. Where did Adam get this idea to hide? He didn't learn it from anybody because he's it. But somehow in the whole process, the, the, the point was, I don't want to be exposed. I don't want God to see me. So come on, Eve, let's go hide. Would you put this down for the first line? Satan comes along and he says, you can hide your sin from God. You can hide your sin from God. <laughs> I mean, you can almost understand why Adam thought he could hide his sin from God. This was the first sin. There was no pattern of sin. That, that no one ever tried to hide from God before. So you could almost say, man, poor Adam. He's so ignorant. He's so innocent. He believed Satan's lie. He thought he could really hide from God. You could almost look at Adam and say that. Man, poor guy. He's just kind of dumb. He just didn't know. How about us? We don't have that same excuse. I mean, why do we try to hide our sin from God? Why is it with everything that we've seen and all that we have in God's word and everything that we've seen in other people's lives, why is it that we try to hide our sin from God and actually think we can at times? Here's the naked truth, and yes, I used that on purpose. The naked truth is this, there's no hiding from God. You can't hide from God. I have, I have so much more to give to you guys, but I'm, I'm trying to shrink this as we go here. You can't hide, you go, oh, yeah, 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 I know that. No, 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 listen, listen. This has to do with something in technical terms. It's called God's omnipresence. Omni means all is all presence. God is everywhere at all times. There is no place that God isn't. God doesn't have parts. So you can't have part of God here and then part of God in another part of the world. No, God is everywhere at once. You say, how does that work? I don't know. I mean, God's a whole lot bigger than my little brain can figure out. But God is outside, of, we talked about this before, he's outside of our time. He's outside of space, but in the, in, in the reality of it all, because he made it all, he can be in it everywhere, everywhere. You cannot get away from the presence of God. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 139. I can never escape from your spirit. 
I can never get away from your presence. If I go up into heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. God, I can't get away from you. You're everywhere. In Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah says this. Uh, or God is speaking through Jeremiah. He says, am I a God who's only close at hand? Am I only a God that's next door to you? No, I'm far away at the same time. Can anyone hide from me in a secret place? Am I not everywhere in all the heavens and the earth, says the Lord? God says, look, you can't get away from me. I'm everywhere. You can't hide from me. Your sin is not hidden from me. You may be all by yourself. You may be sitting in a dark room doing whatever it is that you're doing. You may be in a place somewhere far away in a hotel room, another part of the world. Nobody knows your name. Nobody knows your face. Nobody knows anything about you. But God knows. You cannot hide from God. But somehow, even way back in the garden, Adam had this notion that he could hide from God. And he didn't want to feel exposure. He didn't want to feel uh, that the, the shame. And so the way he dealt with it was he hid. Now, let, let me just inject this. When God says to him, Adam, where are you? I, I want you to understand that is the most gracious thing God could have done. Because what was the penalty? What did God tell them the penalty would be if they ate from the tree? The day that you eat of it, what? You will surely die. Now, they did begin to die physically. They, they ended up spiritually uh, dead, separated from God. But, but the reality is, they could have been struck dead right then. Right then, God could have struck them. But when God comes along and says, Adam, where are you? It's God's way of giving Adam an opportunity to say, God, I'm right here, and I've done something terrible. But he doesn't do it. He runs and he hides. And we're running and hiding from God's presence even today when we sin. And the question is, are we really that stupid? And the answer is, yes, we are. And I'm right there. I'm in the front of the line. I'm not just pointing the finger at you. Hey, as I'm going through this, I'm going, man, how can I say that Adam had more of an excuse than I do? But the reality is, folks, that God's presence is everywhere. Listen, what Jesus said in Matthew 6.6, 6, he says, when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, listen, who sees everything, will reward you. Let me tell you something. The omnipresence of God, the fact that God is everywhere, is amazingly comforting. Because what that means is that you can, there's no place that you can go that God won't be there with you. That's amazingly comforting, especially when you're in scary situations. It is also amazingly terrifying <laughs> to know that there is no place I can go on this earth and do what I am desiring to do with regard to my sin, that God won't be, and no place that God won't see. That's amazingly terrifying. And may I remind you that scripture says it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Folks, we have lost the fear of God, not just in our country, but in our churches. We have so wanted a God of grace and a God of love, and he is, he's all of that, that we have downplayed the reality that he is God. He's big. He spoke and it came into existence. And he said, don't do these things. And when we do, we flaunt God's love. We flaunt God's grace. We flaunt God's justice. And we need to get back to a point where there's a real serious fear of God. You say, wait a minute, I thought fear just meant awe. It doesn't really mean to be afraid. Yeah, there's a certain degree that, yes, it means to be afraid. When I was growing up as a kid, I loved my dad. He was a great guy. I could go and talk to him, and we'd have great times together. But let me tell you something. I feared my dad, too. I feared those words from my mom when I screwed up at home and he wasn't there, when she said, just wait till your father gets home. I feared for my life. 
I would listen for that car. And you know what I did when that car came, when I heard the sound of his car driving up? I didn't run to the door and fall on my knees and say, Dad, I have sinned. I went and hid. I didn't want to be exposed. I didn't want to go through what I knew was inevitably what I would have to go through, and that is judgment. And that's exactly where Adam and Eve were. They hid because they didn't want to be exposed. And that's why you and I hide. We don't want to be exposed. Can I tell you something today? There are people that aren't here this morning that once were here, that worshiped with us, that loved with us, that outreached with us, that was family, and they're not here this morning. You know why? Because they're hiding. Because they bought into Satan's lie, and they think that, well, th well I can't go to church because that's where God is. Like, this is the only place he is. <laughs> Folks, there are people that will avoid me. I know that's hard to believe. A nice guy like me, and people will avoid me. But there are people, I've seen it. They, they avoid me. I see them. They kind of catch me out of the corner. And, go, and they avoid me. Like I'm God. But I, just because of what I represent, they don't want to be in my presence. Because somehow, they think if they hide from me, they're hiding from God. You go, oh, that's stupid. Then why do you do it? Now, I mean, you know, why do they do it? That's what I meant to say. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. We don't want to be any place where we sense that God is when we're not right with him. And so we hide. We may not be hiding in the trees like Adam and Eve were, but we hide. Because I don't want to be exposed. I don't want to deal with the reality that there are consequences to what I've done, and I've got to face them. Man, we could keep on going, but we can't. We're going to move on to the second one. In their attempt to hide their sin, I mean, God says to them, Adam, where are you? Hey, well, I heard you, God. Uh, I was afraid because uh, I was naked. And so I hid, and God says, well, who told you you were naked? Now, Think it, it's kind of comical if you stop and think about it. <laughs> There's only Eve, <laughs> you know? Adam, who told you you were naked? She's naked too. How did she figure it out? I mean, it's not like the neighbor knocked on the door and said, hey, Adam, could you put some clothes on? You're really offending me. Adam, who told you you were naked? Again, it's God's grace. Adam, look, it's, it's up. It's done, Adam. I know what's going on. Just confess. But he... But he doesn't. What's he do? The woman. It was the woman that you gave me. <laughs> it's always the woman's fault, isn't it? Oh, right. I, I, <laughs> the woman you gave me. You see what he's doing here? Would you put this down for number two? Here's the second sin. Your sin is not really your fault. It's not really your fault. That's what Satan comes along and tells you. It's not your fault. Adam, did you eat from that tree? But it's not my fault. It's hers. I mean, it's just like what we did when we were kids, right? The teacher catches you hitting the other kid. Why did you hit him? Well, because he hit me. Oh, well, then that makes it okay. We're good. Let's just keep going. On. But, but that's what's going on here. Well, it's... It's not my fault. It's hers. And you realize what else he's saying here? It's, he doesn't just say it's the woman. He says it's the woman you gave me. Do you realize what Adam's saying? God, it's her fault. And if you won't buy that, then it's your fault. <coughs> Man. But I mean, you got to think of it. You got to start feeling sorry for Adam a little bit. He didn't have many options. How many people is he going to blame? <laughs> I mean, he's only got one other person to blame, you know? Poor guy. He can't say, well, you don't know the parents that I had. Wait a minute. I didn't have parents. Um, man, the neighborhood I grew up in. Oh, I'm in paradise. Um, who's he going to blame? He blames the person closest to him. 
He blames the person that he was supposed to be protecting. He blames the person he was supposed to be leading. He blames the person he's supposed to be guiding. He blames the person that God put in his trust and his care, and he blames that person and ultimately blames God. And the reality is, folks, that that is where we find ourselves so many times today. It's really not my fault. Okay, okay, I did it, but it's not really my fault. I had terrible parents. Do you, you don't understand how I grew up. Well, yeah, I did that, but you know what? It's just the way, I, it's just the way God made me. Ooh, well, that puts the blame back on God, doesn't it? Yeah, I lost my temper, but you know, it's just kind of the person I am. You, you don't understand, yeah, I did that, but you just don't understand the stress that I'm under. It's not my fault. Um, well, yeah, I did it, but she practically threw herself at me. Well, if they'd cut you off on the road like they cut me off, you would have flipped them the same finger. You don't understand. <laughs> You don't understand because you're not married to him. You're not married to her. You don't, if you were, you'd know why. It's not really my fault. But the one I think that we hear most often is, okay, yeah, I did it. I'm sorry, but. Whenever you hear the but in the I'm sorry, there's not, a, there's not enough.